Uh, the Goodwill to Garber class kind of is an extension of and melding of two different classes I've taught in the past. One is my uh, class on Goodwill to Garb and the beginning fencing armor class that I've taught before. Um, usually because at some point we end up going off on bunny trails and end up going into one section or the other, depending on the class that we started in. Um, the, biz the first part of, of, of this is the Goodwill. So the thrifting aspect of this, um, which I know a lot of people like to thrift and go and get stuff. Um, we have a local guy who does armor and woodwork and he finds all kinds of machinery and parts and stuff that at our, some of our local thrift shops. He said he found, a, uh, I was talking to one day and he said he found a $200 sander for five bucks because it didn't work. He oiled it and it worked. Yeah, because people donate crazy stuff. But um, when it comes to going to the Goodwill, obviously most things don't have tags on them to identify fiber content or, you know, you know, if it's a full blend, if it's a natural fibers, whatever. So the biggest part of buying things from the Goodwill and thrift or thrift stores or Salvation Armies or state sales or garage sales is being able to identify the fibers um, because when you're making armor that's important because you don't want to buy the upholstery fabric that or the 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 curtains that have the blackout on the backside or the gummies or the rubber or the plastic coating because if you try to make armor with that yeah it's pretty Whoever wears it's gonna wanna take it off in half an hour because they're gonna sweat to death. Cause I know someone who tried to do that. Didn't turn out well. It was it was lone armor, so we ended up putting it in gold key because turning it into gold key means that somebody's not, you know, as active most of the time. And that's better. Because, you know. We don't want it, somebody to get heat stroke while they're fencing because that causes problems. Um, if you're not aware of how to identify fibers, there are lots of tests. Um, most people refer to a burn test. Which, yes, burn tests, they're great. But their stars aren't going to let you do a burn test inside their store because, you know, they don't want you lighting things on fire. Though if you ever find one, that's pretty lucky. Um, things like, like with burn tests, if you do a burn test, like things like cotton and linen, they'll smell like paper when they burn, because natural fibers tend to smell like paper, um, at least plant-based ones. Um, wool smells like burnt hair, like silk kind of smells like burnt hair, so, um, that's not a pleasant smell, but if that, if you do a burn test on fibers, and that's what you smell, more than likely, you got wool or silk in some proportion in there. Um, poly, with a burn test, will melt polyester. So that's kind of a no-no because it also doesn't breathe well. So that's going to be something that, you, that somebody will get really warm in. Um, cotton and linens, they're really great. You can find cotton and linen blends a lot, not always 100% cotton, not a, and usually rarely 100% linen. Um, but for armor, you want to usually you're looking for larger pieces of fabric. So you're going to end up with blends 90% of the time. So if you can get a cotton linen blend, sometimes a cotton polyester blend isn't bad, depending on the quantities of how high or low that is. And you can only kind of guesstimate in the store um, until you can get a burn test and see if it melts a lot or a little. Because if you only get a, a little bit of melting with it looks kind of like a um, little pilly on the back, um, you're probably going to be mostly okay. And 
And honestly, the rule of thumb of telling fencers to make their first armor out of trigger, most trigger you find in stores now is a high polyester content and not as much cotton content. It's harder to find the 100% cotton trigger in stores. And when you do, it's usually beyond what most beginning fencers want to pay for fabric. Um, because I know our local Joann's hasn't carried it in about 10 years. And we don't have a Hancock's anymore because they went out of business. So if you're looking for 100% cotton, I think Joann's carries it on their website, but uh, I have a fabric stash at this point, so I don't tend to buy new fabric anymore. <laughs> because um, I honestly inherited my mom's fabric stash and my grandmother's and my Aunt Mary's fabric stash. So I have four fabric stashes in my house right now. So it's gonna be a while before I get through it all to figure out what I'm keeping and what's going away. But what I used to do a lot was buy the fabric from the thrift store. And occasionally you'll find where it is still raw fabric and not anything done with it. Usually because like in my case, Someone donated it because it came from an estate. Or somebody bought it for a project and it didn't work. Um, I have I brought one of my husband's. This, my husband's lovely armor he doesn't wear anymore because he has shinier armor, um, was a duvet cover. Because when you're looking for large pieces of fabric, they'll have comforters, duvet covers, curtains, sheets. Um, occasionally, if you're not picky about material, you can also use the skirting for a, be a bed skirting um, because a lot of times that's folded over. So if you unfold it, you have sometimes about a yard's width, which is plenty of room for sleeves, leggings sometimes. So it all depends on what you're looking for uh, when it comes to the fabric. Now, when it comes to armor, when you're looking at these things, be very aware you're going to want to punch test them before you make anything. Because you're going to want probably at least two layers. If it's a thicker curtain and a thinner lining, because you, if you're, because you can pair like say, a really good sheet with a curtain. Um, pick an edge corner, get, get one of the marshals from the local group to punch test that or drop test it. Because if it doesn't pass, you can try adding layers or put like, usually the general rule is you put more layers down than you want, than you want and then test it until it fails. And then go the number of layers before that, and that's how many you make armor out of. With the way I've been doing it with the thicker, like curtain or upholster fabric and one layer of the thinner bedding or plain cotton cotton, I've been able to keep my husband's armor down to two layers. So it still breathes and it's still sparkly, but it's not as hot as four layers of trigger. So I'm probably and not as expensive as buying two layers of the really nice linen that you use cut on the bias so that it's only two layers and stronger, but then you end up buying more fabric because you have to cut it on the bias to get that strength needed to pass the drop test. Um, anybody have any questions yet? Yeah, I'm not on Facebook, so I to go look. Uh, I'd have to find it. Nothing close okay. to there. Yeah, okay. Um, so again, going back to the fabric. Um, one thing you, you do not want to ever make your armor out of is silk. Um, because if you're not familiar with silk, when it gets wet, it gets fragile. And when I mean fragile, I mean, if you make a pair of pants out of it and they get wet and you go to take a step and it's just a tiny bit too far, 
dull shred. I've seen it happen. So silk and armor, not a good idea. It may seem extra fancy. It may be really pretty. Don't use silk and armor. It's a big no-no. And by, by, I saw it happen is I bought a pair of pants that were silk that I rehemmed and gave them to my husband. I said, these are court only pants. Do not wear them fancy. He packed his armor for the day. I packed my garb for the day. I went inside and took my ANS classes. He went outside and fenced. I came outside and guess what pants he had on? Mm -hmm, the silk pants. And then he shredded them because in fencing you get warm, you sweat, and silk shreds. So yeah, don't use silk on armor ever. You can use faux silk. Um, you can find, if you think, if you can find polyester and cotton blends that's a faux silk can be really pretty, but they're not gonna shred. But also most likely you're not gonna find those at a thrift store because most likely you're gonna have to find those from a fabric store. And those usually run between 15 and $30 a yard. They're not cheap. They're durable, but they're not cheap. So. Oh. And I'm gonna get drinking because I'm talking a lot and I'm getting a dry throat. This is different. I usually do do this as a discussion and there's always questions. <laughs> um, okay, in making the armor from the thrift store, so you buy, you buy the fabric as duvets, comforters. Now with comforters, there's usually an interior layer, so all you'd have to do is take that inner layer out and you, you'll you fine as long as it still passes the punch test. Um, but other things to think about that you may not think about is not only can you find the fabric at the thrift store, you can find notions, you can find patterns, and you can find all kind of nifty things, but not necessarily where you think. And I don't think I put this in the notes. But for patterns, if you don't have a pattern you already like, a basic D tunic will work as a pattern starter. But also, if you go to um, whatever size you normally wear and go one size up and you find a t-shirt or a loose blouse and you want it to be loose because you're gonna be cutting it apart, you can cut along the seams and that shirt is now your new pattern. So it's gonna work for, for armor. I mean, most of my husband's first armor was a teaching pattern, so the big square, which is in the handout, and I just cut right down the middle. You know, because that makes it easy. It's a T-tunic with a cut down the middle. I don't do, do that quite anymore, but for easy armor, you can do a T-tunic and then you just slide over your head, but a lot of people like to be able to open it. So you do the T-tunic, with a cut down the front. So if you're not comfortable drawing out a T tunic pattern, that's where the shirt pattern comes in. Because if you get a button up shirt or a t shirt, you can write down that middle, you know, everybody. Yeah, there you go. There's your pattern. Uh, um, but notions, what I'm talking about notions is you can find buttons, zippers, snaps, Velcro. Um, it, you, you can find trim, you can buy, find yarn for coring. You just have to know what you're looking for in the craft section because a lot of times they'll just put it in a big cup and leave it there. So you have to have patience and you have to know what you're looking for. But it also then goes back to that first section of you have to know your fibers a little bit. Um, I know period wise, linen's great for, for garb for every day. Um, and it's great if you can get the two on a bias cut for armor, but it's not gonna last a whole lot long, long as you might want it to. So, if you go with something like 
if if you're doing the lin all linen, you can do three layers, and it'll last a little bit longer. Or if you go with the upholstery with a lining fabric, um, I I've made some for for my husband that we regifted to somebody else because I made new armor for him, and it's going on four or five years old now because I made it before we were married. So it's going to last. You just have to watch it and, and drop test it every year. Um, now with thinner materials like the linen and some of the thinner duvets and comforters, um, yes, make it, uh, make sure it passes that drop test and then make it wear, wear it, and when you hit that year, year mark, retest it. Because these aren't brand new fabrics, they're used fabrics. So they're gonna wear at a different rate than brand new fabric from the fabric store. So you're supposed to test, drop test armor on a regular basis anyway. So as long as you remember when you make it, that's when you drop test it. I, most of Marshall's armor has been made and finished in usually May or June. So every June I get out his, his drop tester and I make him drop test his armor or, you know, I do it because I know how to. I'm not a Marshall, but I, I can still run the, the drop test and it's, it's you, the, the armor that I held up earlier has now failed it this year. So that's not going back on the field as is. I have to decide yet if I'm going to add fabric to the lining to add strength to it or repurpose it to a everyday jacket. I haven't decided yet. Hey, Maggie's here. Usually there's someone interrupting me. <laughs> I, I don't I just end up talking. Uh, see, how far did I get? Actually, with me just talking and talking, I think I ran through everything pretty much in 20 minutes. Oh boy, any questions at all? Like on baking armor or fabric questions or Tips, tricks. If you'd like, I can unmute yeah. everybody. And you can specifically yeah. ask them. I, that would be fine. Anybody have any questions? No, I think I'm good. <laughs> yeah, this usually it runs as a discussion class and usually goes 45 minutes to an hour. But as a as a lecture class, it goes a lot faster. Yeah, I I'm pretty new to the SCA, so I actually just made a good portion of my armor already with the help of Rosa and Daniel down there. Cool. Um, uh, I have my um, my yeah. chest piece done already with a resistant material that passed the punch test. So that was like this this within the past six months. So. I'm good on that, and and uh, the uh, the hood is what I made actually. Sorry, um, I have um, my own um, fencing jacket because I fenced in high school, so I just wear that underneath material that looks period. So, so the the under fencing jackets are really good. Um, a lot of people move away from that those oh, yeah. eventually just because a lot of people end up overheating in those. Because I'm used to it. I'm yeah. used to fence because I mean I didn't fence in it for many years, so I'm used to that. But also, it's like I already have that invested. You know, the, the money invested yeah. into it is already there, so it's like I'll ride that until it literally doesn't take any. You know, any uh, any staff until it anymore. falls apart. Literally, um, or yeah. or it doesn't fit, and no, both of those aren't really happening anytime soon. So, yeah. Anybody else have any questions? 
So of course, and Daniel may help Avi make his. I, I'm pretty sure they probably know their way around a sewing machine and in, in armor. Mostly Rosa. She's amazing. <laughs> that's, that's kind of what we do. Um, Daniel is the Karaguan rapier marshal. And okay. MOAS, and I kind of kid people. I joke around. I say I'm a combat seamstress because one of my big things is getting people into their own gear. Yes, we have loner gear, but sharing hoods is just <laughs> yeah, yeah. That changed pretty quick, honestly. Every time they're still gross. <laughs> so when I'm saying Marshall, my husband Marshall is Warder Rashid. Mm. So I've made almost all of his armor. So that's kind of like our household. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Daniel's actually starting to um, take on sewing his own his own right now. I noticed that. Yeah. I saw that. I'm impressed. I'm I'm, uh, I'm uh, dragging him into the the fabric world a little bit. <laughs> everybody needs to know. I always feel like everybody needs to know at least the basics, because, you know. I've been at events and somebody's come rushing over going, I ripped my armor. Does anybody have any needle and thread? And they've sat there and sewn their armor back together while people are out doing melees. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, I actually have a friend that I'm going to probably try and recruit um, for at the very least sewing stuff. Um, it's my friend Michaela who I'm going to be rooming with this coming semester. Um, and <laughs> she actually has my um, the green tunic that I popped a hole in the uh, armpit. Um, mm -hmm. She's uh, she's going to be hand sewing the uh, patch in because I got pretty frustrated trying to hand sew it myself. Are your arms tight and that's tight? Is um, the tunic is a little bit tight in the chest. I got it secondhand from a friend and I used it for costume purposes before and I thought it would be good enough the first time when I, um, uh, this was MCAD. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like, Has anybody why? ever told you about gussets? No. Yeah, that's what we were doing, Avi, remember? Oh, okay, I just didn't know the term for it. Yeah, that's basically what we were trying to do, but I actually have to get more material because the gusset that we made is a little bit too small. Yeah. Okay. So I just have Yeah, to I put those on in every single piece of armor my husband owns because invariably he'll, yeah. he'll move his giant arms, and if yeah. they were fitted like they're supposed to be, for his persona, he'd bust those things. Yep. Yep. That sounds about right. That's basically what happened. Yep. Yeah. So I got to get. I did that material. way exactly. back when because I used to dance. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's one project that I have kind of pending. And another one is I actually want to make a tunic in a Roman style because, as Dan and Rosa know, um, I picked up a secondhand suit of Roman legionary armor from a, an estate sale. So that's kind of one of the things I was intrigued by this class is because it's like, oh, Goodwill and, you know, secondhand stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I know pretty well about that. I picked up a, it was a um, chess piece helmet um, for $200 with a mannequin too, actually. Wow. Yeah. So I was like, I can't pass on this. And I love Roman history. So now it's making me call in the question of what persona I actually want to explore in the SEA. Have, have you talked to anyone who has a Roman persona about how to make those? Um, no, I could talk to Becky because I know she's done a lot of Roman um, costuming. I don't know if she's done SCA personas in it, but I know she's done costuming. and Yeah, Tojume has done some, um, just Roman costuming in general. Um, yeah. Ursus, Ursus, the tunics that he wears with the embroidery on the shoulders. Gotcha, he, yep. I think a fairly late Roman. Um, so you can talk to him about it a little bit. I'll have to do that. Yep. There's also some Facebook groups that are for Roman personas, I believe. I'll have so to if you can find them, they might be able to also help. Yeah. I'll have to look into it because I do like both the Roman era and the persona I could create around that. But I also really do like the kind of... Uh, medieval period I was looking at doing like a hunter like uh, woodsman kind of persona English woodsman. Now, here's a here's something that a lot of people end up doing is they wear all the clothes they want and it don't 
necessarily yeah. based on their persona. Yeah, that's I basically have, <laughs> I have Danish garb and I have mid-transitional Venetian garb. So those are like 500 years apart. Yep. Yeah. My thing is like, I, I like both archery and fencing. So, and I, and I also like the other uh, Roman, Roman history. I like medieval history. So I like different aspects of those things. And I really like the idea of using the SCA as a good excuse to show off the armor and the stuff that I enjoy about those different parts of history um, and using it as an outlet. So that's okay. basically what it comes down to. It's pretty funny because I have this mannequin sit standing here with the Roman armor and sometimes my family will come up the stairs and <laughs> if the lights are off, they just see this imposing figure with armor standing right there. It's great. <laughs> Like, this is exactly why I wanted this right here. <laughs> uh, a little bit of a passion project for, for me has been trying to help people get um, authentic or authentic looking fencing armor. Um, so one of the gals in the group here and I were playing around with a faux sideless surcoat that would be one garment that would have kind of the, the underdress kind of stitched, kind of faked into it so that there would be nothing to catch the blades. And so that everything could be layered up appropriately for the punch proof. Yeah, then you would make the under portion of the dress, I think the, the armored portion and then the upper would just be pretty. Um. We were we were playing around with some different ideas, um, just going with very simple fabrics, um, just you know linens or linen blends that we mm -hmm. that pass punch, and just kind of basically making a sideless surcoat and then adding in the portions of the underdress, almost um, almost like one of those you know body con you know like the black and white you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and kind of doing it that way. And then maybe slapping some trim on to hide that seam a little bit. And um, so we, we haven't gotten around to trying to actually draft that out, but yeah, that, yeah I know it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a sewing puzzle. Yeah, that, of course I'm thinking in my head, I'm going, some of the things make sense that you could do that easily, but some of them right. take a little bit of finagling. Yeah, I feel like really hide it if you put faux ermine or fur on it. Oh yeah, I mean you could get you could get crazy. You could you know put um, fabric stamping on it to to jazz it up and uh, oh oh yeah, I, I know all about fabric stamping. <laughs> but it was just it was more the the kind of um, thought experiment with the construction of yeah. how we take all of these multi layered authentic garb ideas and sort of condense them down into what would be a little bit lighter to wear as far as heat and movement mm -hmm. but then still kind of give the the 10 foot you know impression of right. you know, have a white you know collared shirt on underneath of my doublet that's underneath of my jerkin yeah but it's actually all just one garment <laughs> and everything because most of the time i've seen it done the other dress has been completely separate from the surcoat or the jacket or the doublet, and that's the armor. I I do the armored portion of it, and then everything else is just additional because you don't necessarily need it, but it makes it look nicer. Right. Yeah, it's easier to kind of wrap your head around it if you're looking at something that's more like Elizabethan, because you can always yeah. just stop a frilly rough on something and and move on. But move on to to do that for some of the um, sort of mid-period things that have very dramatically different layers like the sideless surcoat um, yeah. where it, it would look really cool to fence in a sideless surcoat but you just really don't want that blade trap you know hazard at least that was the concern that was brought up to me yeah that is a concern I almost feel like the, the cheat of making it separate and then just making a line of Velcro on the underdress <laughs> and attaching it that way 
would be a cheat because then you wouldn't have to change the um, construction methods of the dress or the surcoat, but then you, but you would also be able to eliminate the blade catching. Yeah, I feel though that you would still end up with problems getting your, your punch proof layering because you would have extra fabric in some areas like the chest and the back and around the hips, but then under the arms, your entire side of your torso and underarm is gonna be exposed. So if you layer up the torso of the underdress to where it's you know punch proof, then put the sideless surcoat on over the top, you're just adding that one extra layer. One extra layer. Overheating is a big problem for a lot of fencers. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we have a number of fencers that, that really have trouble with heat. So we're trying to kind of figure out how can we pare this down to be as minimalist as possible, possible. still function properly and give off a, you know. A feminine touch. Yeah, a feminine touch, a G-Wow effect, you know. It'd be kind of, it's kind of great to look amazing while you're fencing. <laughs> what if you cut out the circuit, not sewed it, and then laid it over the underlayers and traced it out so that you could make a seam where yeah. the edges of the surcoat would be, and that would be your top layer. So it would look like a surcoat. Exactly. That's that's kind of what we're that's kind of what we're thinking. And then, like I said, we just sort of just put some trim over that that seam that goes around kind of the arm and shoulder mm -hmm. to just kind of hide it a little. You know, just kind of hide it a little more. Yeah, a little bit more illusion. You know, obviously that that um, underdress wouldn't be super well fitted. No. It'd be a little bit looser. Yeah kind of traditional, you know, vampy way of wearing it, but. Yeah, you're also, I've that. also was known for making armor that had trim that looked like zippers on it, back when metal zippers weren't allowed to be exposed. <laughs> because a marshal pissed me off because he kept saying my zipper was exposed when the entire thing was made with a plastic zipper and Velcro. Uh-huh. <laughs> and the marshal of the group said, okay. He said, because if you're on the field, that means you've passed inspection. And if you've passed expansion, every single one of them has looked at that and known that's trim. <laughs> and anyone who tries to pull you off the field is pulling whoever inspected you an idiot. And really, that's a discussion to be had if you think somebody's an idiot and let somebody out on the field with a exposed metal. Yeah. Yeah. Something else that's kind of interesting about um, fencing armor, um, because Daniel has has he was doing kind of a more of an Elizabethan period, but he's joined me in the uh, the late fourteen hundreds Florentine. Creator. <laughs> no, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> Those are his loyalties lie. Um, <laughs> I'm just giving him flack. You, you eventually pick different things and just go back and forth, it seems. I don't think anybody sticks to one thing forever. Yeah. I'm I'm fairly consistent. That's, that's fairly unusual. Um, I, I had a Welsh persona for 13 years, so... Okay. <laughs> Something that was kind of neat about the, uh, the farsettos, the doublets that they were wearing... Mm -hmm. Um, not necessarily in Florence, but in Milan around the, the 1480s, 1490s, is the back of the farsetto was actually split. So it was stitched around the waist, and then that back seam was open up until about their shoulder blades. And so you could see their undershirt underneath. So that was kind of an interesting way to get around some of the um, stretch and fit problems. Yeah. I hadn't looked that much into them. It's an interesting yeah. alternate. Um, you know, when yeah, you that would be. When you compare it to like the um, uh, the Japan a little bit earlier, the Japan mm -hmm. really deep circles um, that go over the shoulder blades, the really deeply inset sleeves, because that was their way of trying to get around some of the problems of stretch and, right, and movement. Those. Yeah, I've seen those, and I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah, 
but the the 1490s ish uh, Farsetto has a lot fewer pieces. Still has that really fitted waspy waist, you know, kind of look. Look. But then you turn around and the back split. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. It's a cheat. Yeah. We 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 all have our own cheats, and they just had different ones that we get to relearn. Mm-hmm. Those are sort of interesting too. Finding those little tidbits, that you're like, ah, that's how these guys manage to move. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they look like they're, you know, in a straight jacket. In a straight jacket. It's like, you know, you look at some of the pictures. And I'm like, why are their stomachs so flat? Oh, because it's a stomacher. It's a piece of board. Mm -hmm. It's not actually their stomach you're seeing. That's why the fabric stretches on the sides of it just a little bit to wrinkle because it's pulling. The fabric, but it's not with the body, it's just with the fabric. That's why it's tiny little pulls instead of the giant pulls you get when somebody's just a little bit too big for their garb. I've looked at a lot of Venetian and other stuff with the ties. Because uh -huh. everybody's like, well, they, they wore coarse, and I went, you, you see, see these folds? That doesn't happen if you're wearing a corset. <laughs> Oh, you don't get folds because folds can't happen. The Italian corset conundrum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I met somebody once who decided that all, all, all 16th and 15th century garb had to have a car, corset underneath it. And I'm looking at it going, mm -hmm. nope. uh, I'm not sure that's a correct statement. There, there's no whole lot of documentation one way or another, so you can go both ways. Yeah. I liked um, some of the recent literature that's come out, like the, uh, the typical tutor that mm -hmm. is on. Um, and so there, you know, that is, it's not corseted. I haven't read that yet. That's on, that's on my list to get to read. Mm. I've just seen a few pictures in it and yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's on my wish list. <laughs> I've gotten a few of the Jana Arnold books and I have the Tudor Taylor, but I don't have the new one that Seraphina's on the cover of. That's kind of amazing. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I used to have the Janet Arnold books and I have the uh, Eleonora de Toledo. Moda Firenze. Oh, wow. I've had that one for a while. I don't do that time period anymore, though. Um, not much, anyway. Yeah. It's a little too straight-laced for me. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure I'd want to do that period and country. I like color, I think, a little too much. Yeah. I'm a big fan of bright colors. Oh. The, um, the fashions of Milan are pretty loud. Yeah, I found a wool silk one that together it's yellow and blue threads, but when you look at it from a distance, it's neon green. Huh. So, yep. That's one of my favorite finds ever. That's neat. Mm hmm It's also a reminder that sometimes what you think is the color of the threads may not be the color of the threads. It's an optical illusion. It's not really neon green. It's blue and yellow. Is Just it like the US in elementary school, blue and yellow equals green. Is it blue shot with yellow or yellow shot with blue? Do you know? Um, most of it is blue shot with yellow. Okay. Cool. So, because there, there's times it gets a little bit of an iridescent thing going with it too, so. Yeah. I wish I could turn my Facebook sound off. It keeps making noise. Is it, has there been any questions in the uh, Facebook? I can do that. I can go look. Nothing most posted there. You've got, I've got three likes on it though. 
Okay. Well, there are people watching. <laughs> At this point, just watching, watching me blather on and, and chit chat. That's another way to get information, though. That is. I, I re really do normally teach this as, as a round table discussion class, and it bounces a lot easier and instead of all of the information packed in the first 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, you're fine, honestly. I just thought it was interesting because, like, I just have the tendency and propensity to try and find things actually when they're already like made kind of trying to find secondhand um made goods versus garb or not garb um cloth for garb i just never was one to like i'm mostly because i'm new to actually like sewing and the creation of it but i'd always find the 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 ready-made garb or um armor stuff like that this might be a not question avi what size are you i am um, like a medium men's. Um, I'm I'm short, but I'm like kind of broad shouldered. I'm five four. The reason I ask mm -hmm. is sometimes you'll find linen suits at Goodwill. Now yeah. you can't use the jacket so much because of the way they're tailored. But linen pants would be really handy to have if you fit into them to wear at events. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. I do have kind of a, uh, like, I would call them like breeches or, yeah, breeches is probably the most accurate term I could use that I picked up off Amazon. And also, look in the lady side for pants. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah, Be because a lot of times, even though linen suits are both men and women, mm -hmm. you find the ladies more often. Yeah, at sounds the thrift stores. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I have a couple that I've bought that way that that's in my uh, garb closet to be used for patterns for gold keys. So, okay, I'll just keep that in mind. They have stains on them. That's why I'm not using them for garb, but I can take patterns out of them. So you can be yes. or dye them. Yeah, but it's make. yeah. They're there. I just haven't gotten to them yet. So one's teal and one's bright orange. So that's why they're not actually getting worn. <laughs> yeah, I'm still just really proud of my pre recent estate sale finds. It wasn't just the Roman. It, and sometimes it's a matter of patience and having a right eye. Yeah. Because it's, it's not always going to be all there. And when you like to thrift, some, sometimes they'll have everything you want. And sometimes they'll have nothing that you want. Yep. So it's it's being prepared to walk out with nothing. Yep. yep. So. I haven't been for a while, but yeah, it's been kind of odd and just yeah. out of the norm for all of us. Well, Rana and Rasa and Daniel said they're gonna head out, so. Thanks for coming. Nice chatting with you.